Afternoon, folks. Welcome to The Daily Politics. It's Theresa May's first day at number 10, and she's been making some sweeping changes to her government, saying farewell to many of the big names from the Cameron era and welcoming some surprising figures to her team. Mrs May promised to lead a country that works for the many, not the privileged few. Where have we had that before? But it's likely that it will be Britain's exit from the EU that will define her time in office. The biggest surprise of the reshuffle has been the decision to make Boris Johnson Foreign Secretary, as it's out with the old and in with some of the leading Brexit campaigners. As Theresa May stamps her authority on the Conservatives, the internal crisis in Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party seems to be getting nastier. We'll look at whether Mr Corbyn or his critics have the advantage. And the political cartoonists are sharpening their pencils to satirise Theresa May. We'll talk about their impression of the new Prime Minister. So all that in the next hour. And with us for the duration, former Conservative Minister Francis Maud. He's now a member of the House of Lords. He's seen plenty of reshuffles in his time, but we're glad he hasn't been recalled to high office. <laughs> Or he wouldn't be able to serve the viewing public on public service broadcasting's finest programme. He's also on the Daily Politics. <laughs> so we're going to be bringing you all the latest and Tamira's, to Theresa May's new government. But let me just say, as we came on air, the Bank of England announced its decision on interest rates. It was widely expected that it would cut interest rates. They're only 0.5% at the moment. But actually, it's voted to keep interest rates at 0.5%. Indeed, voted uh, 8 to 1, the Monetary Policy Committee, to keep interest rates on hold and to keep the amount of quantitative easing, uh, the amount of money, electronic money, is put into the market. That's going to stay the same as well. Now, this is significant because in a poll by Reuters this morning, 80% of economists predicted that he would cut the rates. A lot of them were the economists who had lots to say during the referendum campaign too. Uh, and we got an inkling that they may be wrong by the currency markets this morning because both against the euro and against the dollar, sterling started to strengthen. And it would seem unusual for sterling to strengthen if they were anticipating a cut in interest rates. Yeah. So, the governor, I would suggest, has decided to hold on to his firepower for an hour. Don't do it at the moment. Maybe in August, maybe in September, when he gets a better idea of the lie of the land. Well, there's always, I've always thought the biggest danger uh, we were in now was people who'd made dire predictions of cataclysm happening uh, if there was a vote to leave then kind of lending credence to that by the actions that they take. Uh, and I think what this is, is a perfectly sensible decision to hold rates as they are um, and to say, actually, there aren't any early indications of uh, cataclysm that we need to stem with a, a, a cut in interest rates. So I think it's a sensible move. And when it comes to monetary policy, which is what the governor has control over with his, his monetary policy committee, he hasn't got that much room for maneuver, but given that interest rates are so low, they've been at 0.5% yeah. for seven years now, he's got $375 billion of QE out there already. Yeah. Everything he does on the interest rate front and the QE front now is subject, I would suggest, to the law of diminishing returns. No, I'm sure that's right. I mean, you can go, obviously, lower, and that was predicted. Um, and, indeed, there are places where there are negative interest rates. But that's a kind of council of despair, yeah. really. Uh, and the governor has made clear he's not... Although the ECB, uh, the Bank of Japan, yeah. uh, the Riksbank of Sweden, they've all gone into neg negative rates, the governor has made clear he's not a fan of negative rates for the Bank of England. Well, we've also got a stronger economy. I mean, that it is a, pretty much a council of, you know, how do we do something to pick us off the floor? We're not on the floor. Our economy is... Uh, pretty strong. The legacy of the Cameron government uh, has been to take us from a very bad place to having a strong economy with good, strong uh, employment rates. Uh, and, and I think what this reflects is uh, a, a recognition that the world, the roof hasn't fallen in uh, and you don't need to do desperate me take desperate measures to shore things up. All right. Well, it's likely that the economy will be slowing down in this quarter in Q3. There are quite a lot of indications of that. So the governor will probably revisit this decision in August or September on interest rates. But for now, yet again, for the seven years, way back to 
when it began in 2009, interest rates stay at 0.5% today. Joe. Yes. Let's turn back to the other big story of the day, and that's Theresa May's first full day as Prime Minister. After returning from the palace and arriving in Downing Street, Mrs May used her speech outside Number 10 to promise to tackle injustice, and she said she was determined to preserve the unity of the UK. Following the referendum, we face a time of great national change. And I know, because we're Great Britain, that we will rise to the challenge. As we leave the European Union, we will forge a, forge a bold, new, positive role for ourselves in the world. And we will make Britain a country that works not for a privileged few, but for every one of us. That will be the mission of the government I lead. And together, we will build a better Britain. Well, that was Theresa May speaking yesterday. The reaction to that speech, Francis Maud, mm from various quarters, says she's parked her tanks on Labour's lawn. Um, and that may well be the case, uh, looking at the Labour Party as it is at the moment. What was there in that speech, do you think, for what might, one might term true blue Tories? Um, well, I mean, I think the Conservative Party at its best uh, does occupy the centre ground. Uh, and we, we have to be a party, if we're going to succeed electorally, that has an appeal to all parts of the country, geographically, socially, uh, by racial background and so on. Uh, and so she's very much, in that sense, continuing in the uh, direction that David Cameron set and, and the direction he took which made the Conservative Party electable again after a long period in opposition where we lost three general elections in a row. So that's, that's really important. Uh, the thing I think there wasn't so much of in her speech, which is going to need to be addressed, I think, quite quickly, is uh, on the economic front, because you know there is no one uh, has ever suggested that a vote to leave the European Union uh, will not have uh, some short-term shock effect and down downside effect on the economy. And what I think people will want to hear uh, in the days and weeks ahead is some sense of how we're going to use the opportunity that comes from being not in the European Union to build a different kind of economy that is uh, even more buoyant and do, um, str strong than... Do you think that Philip Hammond, who was one of those who did warn of economic gloom and doom if the UK voted to leave the EU, then is the right person, combined with Theresa May, who you could argue isn't a, a, a sort of economic expert, no. um, to then steer Britain through this short-term shock, as you put it? Well, I never felt that Philip was... was his heart was terribly much in the Remain campaign. Um, I ah. mean, he's on the record as having said some time ago that if there were a vote, um, I think in about 2011, he said if there were a vote, he would vote against our membership. Um, and so I think his task is to, see, to set out uh, creatively, imaginatively, what the opportunities are and what how government policy will... Uh, help that. Right. And we need, and, and the key things I think people will want to hear uh, is that there is a very strong commitment by the government to London being an incredibly competitive financial, international financial centre, and that's about a regulatory regime, it's about a tax regime uh, that makes people want to do business from London. All right, well, that's the sort of economic side of it. Let's look at style just briefly and broadly. She's been quite uh, bold, you might say, Theresa May. It's a fairly dramatic reshuffle. A lot of ministerial corpses abound. Yeah, and I think it looks a bit personal, uh, to be honest. Um, I completely understand the desire of a new prime minister to sweep away some of the kind of um, characters who formed the essence of the Cameron government. Uh, I think she shouldn't forget that those were people also who got the Conservative Party into a place where it could uh, get back into government. Um, and so I, I particularly regret the loss of Michael Gove. He's um, you know, a powerful reform, powerful intellect. He's brave and clever and, and principled and a really effective reformer. And All I think right. to lose him... You think it was a mistake? On, I think it was a mistake, yes. All right. We'll leave it there for the moment. Which one is that? Sterling holding steady against the euro at 119, against the dollar it's just over 132 in the wake of no increase in the uh, in, a cut in the interest rates. It looks like the currency markets anticipated, unlike many others in the city, that there wouldn't be a cut.
So Theresa May defied those who thought this could be something of a continuity reshuffle. Instead, we've seen the sacking of some big figures from David Cameron's government, including George Osborne, Michael Gove and Nicky Hunt. Uh, Nicky Morgan, sorry. Jeremy Hunt, we're still not sure he's been removed from health, but we don't know yet if he's got another job. Mrs May also made some genuinely surprising new appointments, including several high-profile Brexit backers in key position. And, of course, in the biggest shock of the last 24 hours, or at least the last 12, Boris Johnson as Foreign Secretary. Joko's got the latest. Yes, so who is in Theresa's gang? Well, yesterday we heard Philip Hammond had taken the keys to number 11 as Chancellor. And Boris Johnson was the first big surprise being appointed Foreign Secretary. While Amber Rudd moves into Theresa May's old job at the Home Office, Mrs May has kept her promise to appoint a Eurosceptic to be in charge of negotiations with Brussels on leaving the EU. David Davis takes that plum role and his Eurosceptic comrade, Liam Fox, has taken on another newly created position. Secretary of State for International Trade, while Michael Fallon keeps his role as Defence Secretary. However, it's not all good news. George Osborne, Michael Gove, Nicky Morgan and John Whittingdale have all been kicked out of the gang. Finally, just before we came on air, we also learnt that Liz Truss has been appointed Justice Secretary and Justin Greening will be the new Education Secretary. We saw that just before we went on air. We did indeed, uh, Joko. Yeah. So uh, the fact that uh, this trust has gone to the Justice uh, Department and also Amber Rudd to the Home Office yes. means that some were speculating. Miss, Mrs May never liked the, the division between Justice and Home uh, when she was in the Home Office and there was some talk that she may bring the two departments together again, but she hasn't kept them separate and instead she's... Uh, put a woman in charge of each. And also on the Department of Education, the Department of Education will take on higher and further education skills uh. and apprenticeships, bringing together, so there is a comprehensive end to that view of separating skills mm. and, and education. If you remember, that was, I think, changed but, under Gordon Brown's time. And given that we're having a separate department for trade deals now, um, we can see what's left of it. It looks, like, it looks to me like the business department is it being and uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change are now going to be merged mm. together. And since a lot of businesses worried about British energy policy, that may be no bad thing to have them both under one roof. We're joined now by Tom Newton Dunn from The Sun, Isabel Oakshot from The Mail. They've both seen their fair share of reshuffles, sometimes in Fleet Street as well as the Cabinet. <laughs> uh, let me put a point to you on this. Uh, Mrs May's reshuffle to date, the Notting Hill set, boom. Mm. Absolutely dead. And you know what is extraordinary is this cabal of people who were at university together, socialised together. They're used to either being in the ascendancy or actually running the country. And, you know, talking to some of these people, there's a kind of shocked devastation that somehow or other they're not in charge anymore. <laughs> and a lot of them have actually fallen out with each other. So it's really had an incredibly traumatic impact on their lives. Poor poppets. Shall I do that again? <laughs> what? Notting Hill set. <laughs> What's your take? I, I'd agree. It is uh, quite astonishingly brutal. I, I think we knew <laughs> Theresa May was going to come in. She's her own woman. She's going to stamp her own authority on that. But to chop off so many heads while she was doing it is, uh, is amazing. And as someone said last night, is very much uh, pour encourager les autres. So this is her now saying, uh, this is my government. You step out of line and uh, you will be going back to the back benches. And that is that. But I think there's something else that's going on here as well, actually. If you look at the lineup. Someone said rather rudely that it's the grown-ups are now back in charge. You know, the older generation of, of the Tory party, where they're leavers, remainers, modernisers, whatever, it's the older guard. Uh, and the second thing is, actually, it's quite a defensive reshuffle. So Theresa May has very carefully, I think, put a whole load of people in position to create a buffer between her and some massive areas of trouble, such as... Mm -hmm. Philip Hammond in the Treasury. Now, he is Mr Doom and Gloom, box office mm -hmm. Phil, as uh, he's known as. Uh, <laughs> the man who's going to do the cuts mm -hmm. and, and the horrible stuff protects her from some of the bad news. Uh, you know, David Davis, Liam Fox mm -hmm. running Brexit. Uh, if Brexit goes wrong, well, you're the people that wanted it. It's going oh, to be But that's only head. fair. They are the, the ones. We're just learning that Jeremy Hunt 
is now expected to stay in his post at the well, Department yeah. of Health. Wow. Uh, and that number 10 is going to confirm that shortly. I mean, online and uh, on the social media, everyone's saying that Mr Hunt had been fired from the Department of Health uh, and or, or fired, sacked from the Cabinet. Then it rained back a little bit, saying, oh, well, he's, he's not doing health, but he may get another Cabinet job. Now we're being told he's probably still at the Department of Health. Now, Dom says, uh, pour encourager les autres which is a pretty good phrase to use because it is Bastille Day today. Mm -hmm. And this is Mrs May's Bastille Day. And is it not the case that if you're a new prime minister, you've also won in the middle, not in the middle, but during the parliamentary term, you've not won a general election leading your party, that you do want to stamp your mark, to, to, to tell everybody this is a new government? Well, and she's done that in spades. I think the uh, decision to axe Gove completely is a particularly significant one. I can't help feeling it almost sends a moral message because there is no doubting amongst Michael Gove's colleagues his competence. He did. He was doing a good job at the uh, Department for Justice. He is clearly an extremely able person. But in deciding to axe him altogether, she's pretty much sending out a message about loyalty and trust, which I think is very important. And in relation to Jeremy Hunt, if he does stay, that will, of course, be very controversial. Number 10, the old number 10, always regarded <laughs> Jeremy Hunt as a very, very competent minister. He's very personable, but, of course, he has really come right up against the doctors in this row over their contracts. That hasn't been resolved, and if he is still there, then how does that play out? It's a potential headache for Theresa May. Well, that's why we all thought that he had been sacked. It would it make sense. It kind of seemed to be yeah. uh, logical. The, the new chief whip is uh, Gavin Williamson. Mm -hmm. wow. No, me neither. <laughs> never mind. No, 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 that's a great appointment. Is that a great appointment? Gavin Wilmerson, very, very little yours? known. Uh, uh, well, he's certainly a friend of all of ours now. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you're not in Parliament. Uh, no, the no he is. He's, uh, we have to, we have to, we, we, we live in Parliament them? because yeah. these people allow us to. So just give us a word on Gavin Wilmerson. Gavin Wilmerson was uh, David Cameron's PPS, bag oh, okay. carrier, mm -hmm. parliamentary private secretary, very and a popular, very, very, very popular, yeah. popular. Yeah. very okay. effective one, loved by the sorry backbenchers, and also knows where all the bodies are. Well, I now know who Gavin Williamson is, and so do you. Welcome. Uh, one of the most controversial, <laughs> and if you're watching, Mr Williamson, of course, you can't come on TV. You're the chief whip. You've got to stay anonymous. Uh, Boris Johnson, Foreign Secretary, one of the, if I can call it, bombshell decisions last night, surprised everybody, including Angela Eagle. This was how she heard about it. Boris is fun, he's great, isn't he bouncing around, sort of going to be the next Prime Minister and all of that. And they never actually put him... <coughs> they've just made him Foreign Secretary. <laughs> no. Speechless. <laughs> Maybe Boris Johnson will do the same if uh, the Labour Party makes Angela Eagle leader of the Labour Party. Um, this is a wise decision, Francis Maud. Well, I thought it was uh, unexpected evidence of a sense of humour. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, Damn Boris, me. we all know Boris is very capable, he's very clever um, and fun. Um, and, um, and, of course, he won't be the way this has been set up. He's not going to be involved in the... Brexit, I imagine. I mean, this will be a diminished role of the foreign. Well, he'll be involved in some way, but the, but presumably David Davis's Brexit department takes the lead. Yes, you'd think so. Uh, Liam Fox's trade department takes the lead on. Well, he'll help David Davis on the trade relationships with Europe, but also yeah. take the lead in new trade relationships sure. with other countries. Absolutely. Uh, so what does the Foreign Office do? Um, I think that's a first question for him to answer. <laughs> Are you thinking uh, not much, then? <laughs> well, no, there is a lot to do. I mean, there's obviously a huge amount um, to still to do. I mean, seriously, the role of permanent seat in the U United Nations Security Council, mm. a load of stuff. There's the Commonwealth. Um, and so, I mean, I think there's an interesting potential to build a, uh, a Commonwealth trade relationships, um, but that, again, would be Liam rather than... A cynic, a cynic, again, may describe Boris's appointment as Foreign Secretary as a rather clever move of defence by Theresa May. But Boris is still the most likely person to become Prime Minister after. Still hugely popular amongst the party. 
Where's the one place that is almost impossible ever to pull off a coup or to challenge for leadership? On a plane halfway to, to <laughs> Malaysia, uh, where really, actually, also, you can't do too much. You've had Europe stripped out from under your breath. Your role is really trying to uh, make the Americans laugh and not offend the Chinese too much. Whether Boris mm. can do either is yet to be seen. So it's, it's okay. pretty clever politics. Now, lots of people don't know a lot about Mr. Hammond, the new uh, mm. Chancellor of the Exchequer, but of course, he and the Daily Politics. Um, we know him rather well um, because he used to come on a lot. I say used to because I doubt he will now as Chancellor. But he used to come on a lot and be interviewed. Indeed, he's been interviewed with some very famous people, not just Joe Coburn, but someone even more famous than Joe Co. Have a look at this. I'm delighted to say that instead of any Labour minister, we're joined by Peppa Pig. I don't think any party has identified in detail how they will reduce public spending uh, over the course of the coming parliament. The question to the Labour Party, to Pepper, if I may, is you have all the civil servants, you have all the data, you're sitting on all the contracts, you know all the forward commitments, why have you not published a comprehensive spending review? My understanding is that Pepper Big Pig is to be made Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, <laughs> under Mr <laughs> Hammond. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, safe pair of hands, accountancy, business background. He understands the figure. I think figures. I think he was shadow chief secretary at one he stage was. In, he was, yeah. in, in the treasury. But there's been, but there's been a lot. Conservative with a small C. But there's been a lot of talk from the May camp and from other parts of the Conservative Party of of ending fiscal austerity, of mm -hmm. building up a big infrastructure fund, borrowing at nearly zero percent, of more imaginative things, of, of really creating a northern powerhouse mm -hmm. that joins South Yorkshire with Lancashire, which would mean that HS2 is not so important as state-of-the-art communications east and west. Is Mr Hammond the man for that? Well, I know you find it quite hard to put Phil Hammond and Imaginative in the same bracket, but actually the thing I'd like to say about Big Phil, as we know him, at Phil. Westminster, <laughs> is he is actually quite different from his public persona. This is uh, not only somebody very competent, but somebody very personable. Mm. I think that he will... Uh, undoubtedly do a very good job. And I think the first hints that George Osborne was doomed came when Theresa May was giving us all that rhetoric about changing policy oh, yes. on, on austerity. It was At that clear point, that it that was, was it. clear that Osborne was out. So I have actually quite high hopes for Big Phil. I don't know about you, Tom. Uh, I think he's highly competent with numbers. Remember, he went into the MOD and, and sorted out a £38 billion yeah. pound deficit there uh, very successfully. He, he really is lacking on uh, emotional intelligence. And I think the problem with he him... He just doesn't although... show it to you, Tom. He isn't. He isn't. <laughs> you're, you're special. Obviously, shows it to you, isn't it? She's a lucky girl. He has to... You know, if he's going to deliver this Theresa May One Nation Healing Society Ooh. policy agenda... Mm -hmm. You really do need a little bit of uh, empathy about him. Standing in the dispatch box uh, and delivering austerity budget after austerity budget, if indeed Mark Carney... But that, the idea is not to do austerity budgets. The, it was the cha former Chancellor who wanted to do the punishment budget, uh, and he'd not survived that. My understanding is it was so unpopular among Tory MPs that Mrs May felt she couldn't continue with him as Chancellor, no, which was just not but, on the cards, and also it was kind of economically uh, and ridiculous. A, and it was well. an absurd thing for him to, to, to threaten done. and... Uh, he is he over? Is it over? Or you, can he bounce back at some stage? Well, people, careers are never over till they're over. <laughs> and he's, he's young, still he's in his mid-40s. He is indeed. Uh, and, uh, and he's very talented. He's very able. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, my favourite Philip Hammond story is a, a senior military person told me um, a week into Philip's t tenure as Defence Secretary. He said they'd gone in with the normal kind of slide deck and... Mm. Um, PowerPoint presentation, and he said, next time, can I have a spreadsheet, please? Oh, <laughs> ah, that's the oh dear, it's about... Right. That's, my, that's my kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be. <laughs> Isabel? Tom, we'll leave you to get on. Plenty to write about today. Right, well, let's sure. talk a little bit more about the comings and goings at number 10 and go over to Downing Street, where Norman Smith, there he is, our man outside number 10 and 11, it seems. Give us the latest. Well, we just had uh, Patrick McLaughlin uh, come out, because he was the former Transport Secretary. Blow me down, he didn't tell us what job he'd got. So what? That's a 
bit of, no, he wouldn't tell us he's the only one, so <laughs> he's moved somewhere. The other bit of news I can tell you is Jeremy Hunt, and we've been faffing around all morning trying to work <laughs> out what on earth's happened to Mr. Hunt. Yes. He's gone in, so I presume he must be moving from health because you wouldn't invite someone in just to tell them, as you were, you stay where you are. So I presume uh, he must be moving to some, some new post. Um, so on the women front, um, I haven't seen actually as many women as we were being promised. I thought we'd see an awful lot more, but so far what we have seen, uh, as you know, Justine Greening, um, Education Secretary moving over from International Development, Liz Truss uh, takes over as Justice Secretary from Environment, and of course Amber Rudd overnight, that massive um, promotion to Home Secretary. She was only an MP six years ago, bang, she's right up there as Home Secretary. But we have not seen this promised march of the women so far. Maybe that's going to come uh, later on. Maybe we'll get that later on. But the one thing which I think, you know, everyone here today has kind of been struck by is the, the scale uh, of this reshuffle. I mean, this isn't just a little nip and tuck. This is wholesale surgery. And what I kind of take from it is two things. One is we're seeing basically the dismantling of the Notting Hill set. Yes. Uh, the key figures... George Osborne, Michael Gove, Oliver Letwin, vroomf, out. And part of the message I think Mrs May wants to send is not merely that she's not part of that, but it's change, it's big change. This is a new government. This is not carry on Cameron. This is an entirely different government. And I think that is why we're seeing such radical reshaping of the cabinet. Right. You sound disappointed by the lack of uh, women coming up uh, Downing Street. Maybe they'll come. Maybe they'll come. Maybe they'll come a bit later to some of those key appointments. No, I'm, I'm an advocate of male, <laughs> pale and stale. I can, I can do that sort of thing. <laughs> I'm glad to see equality reigns here for the men, uh, Norman Smith. Um, there is a question mark still, it seems, next to Jeremy Hunt. We've had conflicting um, uh, sort of indicators about whether he'll stay in health or be moved. So we'll, we'll, we'll hold fire on that a little bit. As you say, mm. brutal. Um, our guest here, Frances Moore, thinks it's also a bit personal. Do you think she may come to regret, to coin a phrase, the fact that she has literally scattered the corpses all over Downing Street? I, I'm not... I mean, there may be a personal element in sort of dispatching Michael Gove, but actually I think it's more canny than personal. And I say that because it's very obvious she has brought the Brexiteers in and said, right, you guys, Brexit. That's your problem. You sort it out. So in the key Brexit facing departments, Foreign Office, Boris Johnson, the new uh, exit from the European Union Department, what a, what a mouthful, uh, David Davis, and the new International Trade Department, Liam Fox. So all the Brexit facing departments have been handed over to the Brexiteers. Now, at one level, you can say, well, that makes sense. They believe in Brexit. They will make it work. Mm. I kind of suspect Mrs May is also thinking down the line that this makes her politically bomb-proof if it all goes mm. badly wrong or if there have to be awkward compromises where we have whether we have to sort of tweak back a bit on ending free movement whether we have to do a deal to stay part of the single market and a backbenchers kick off then she can turn around to them and say hey 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 don't blame me it's not me it's your guys, it's mm. your Brexit people who've done this deal. So I think it's actually quite a canny move. Yes, well, it'll be interesting to see how that actually pans out. And just to tell you, Patrick McLaughlin, who you mentioned at the beginning, has been moved from transport to Tory party chairman. Uh, OK, OK. So well, that there's creates a, a vacancy in the... Tr yeah, now that's interesting because, of course, the great question mark is what happens to Heathrow. And yes. whoever gets the transport job, people will be going through their CV to see whether they have ever said, suggested, muttered anything at all about Gatwick or Heathrow, because okay. that will be, you know, the big decision. All right. We'll leave you to keep your eyes trained on those two doors. It means that the uh, chairman of the Conservative uh, Stephen Party... Crabbs just walk it. Uh, Stephen oh, Crabbs just walking back. in, guys. Oh, has he? There we go. OK. Mr Crabbs. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, we'll Stephen come back Crabbs to you. Just walked in. We'll come back to you, Norman, if there are any more so, significant developments. But thank you. So the current... The new chairman of the Conservative Party is a former coal miner. Yes, which indeed, is, Derbyshire. Which maybe plays to Mrs May's themes. Have we mentioned Justin Greening, that she's got education? We've we have, that? yes, Good, we've right? mentioned Justin Greening. I think we're I'll up to, to date. Up. And, uh, and Boris Johnson has already called Secretary of State Kerry uh, in the United States. That's his first call. I think that would and, be... And, uh, of course, Theresa May's first call was to Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel, indeed. Right, well... Let's move from, well, David Cameron told MPs yesterday that his party had managed resignation, nomination, 
competition and coronation, all before Labour had decided the rules for choosing its next leader. Well, today the party is confirming those rules, but the contest is anything but straightforward and looks increasingly angry. Here's Mark LaBelle. It was a very difficult meeting. Um, it was highly emotionally charged. Um, there was a, a number of colleagues were very, very upset during the meeting, including myself. Um, and there were, there were a number of threats made. There were a number of votes that were obviously um, crucial in determining the future uh, of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn emerged from Tuesday's fractious marathon emergency session of Labour's governing body after a torrid two weeks. Having suffered a vote of no confidence by fellow MPs and facing a leadership challenge, a vote on whether he could automatically stand again went his way. I'm delighted to say the Labour Party National Executive has decided that an incumbent is automatically on the ballot paper. So I'm on the but he may come to rue his decision to leave the crucial meeting at which he had a vote early. Jeremy Corbyn then uh, left the room, went to greet his, some of his supporters outside to see the media, and the NEC then made some other quite significant decisions about that contest, and that gave Jeremy Corbyn's opponents on the NEC and in Labour more widely uh, some hope that they can beat him. 251 <laughs> It was all so different last September. Jeremy Corbyn beat off rivals for the party leadership with an impressive 60% of the vote. Ten months on, despite losing support from 80% of his parliamentary party, he's refused their calls for him to resign, claiming he's still the overwhelming favourite amongst party members. But now that two former shadow cabinet ministers, Angela Eagle and Owen Smith, have both launched leadership campaigns, a battle over the future of the party is underway. So how could Tuesday's NEC rule changes affect the contest? Well, when Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader in 2015 with a quarter of a million votes, which was roughly 60% of the electorate, that was done under a one-member, one-vote system. And of that 60%, 49% were from party members. The other half were from registered supporters, people who paid a one-off fee for a one-off vote, and from affiliated supporters, people who were paid-up members of trade unions or organisations affiliated to the Labour Party. Now, for this summer's contest, the party membership vote is based on members who had joined before January the 12th of this year. And that's roughly the same figure as nine months ago. So that's pretty much the same thing. However, for registered voters, that's changed drastically. The amount you have to pay has gone up from £3 to £25. And the time you have to do that has gone down from three months to two days. The rebels' strategy was always meant to be to recruit uh, moderate centrist voters from outside of Labour through something like the three pound scheme. Um, now the fee is 25 pounds and supporters are only going to be given two days to sign up. There's much uh, less potential, much smaller potential for them to do that. Uh, but that tells you that they w feared that uh, the left would out recruit them, that they wouldn't be able to attract enough supporters to the party to to make a difference. So rather than expanding the electorate, they think the best, their best hope of beating Jeremy Corbyn is to shrink it. But don't forget there's a third group that can vote, the affiliated supporters, with a deadline of the 8th of August to register. Could the Corbynistas use this route to mobilise their supporters? It was immediately noted by some on the left that you can still sign up for affiliated trade unions such as Unite and get a vote in the contest. But we now understand that potentially cheaper route has been blocked by Labour's procedural committee who have just ruled that only people who joined the affiliated groups before January the 12th will be able to vote, with discussions underway to make their deadline to register earlier than August the 8th. Well, I hope that's all clear. Mark LaBelle reporting. To discuss this, we're joined by Matt Rack, General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, and by the Labour MP Nick Thomas-Simmons, who resigned as Shadow Employment Minister recently and who is backing Owen Smith in the Labour Leadership Contest. Welcome back, gentlemen. Hi. In fact, Hi. you faced each other recently, I think, on this very issue, and we don't seem to have progressed very far. Why does a member who joined three months ago have less right to vote in this election than a registered supporter who joins next Tuesday? Well, Joe, clearly that's the kind of issue that it does throw up. But I think that well, six-month period right. would be exactly the same 
to have that qualifying bid if, for example, someone's been selected as a member of parliament, if someone's been selected in a local government election. And the idea is quite simply to have that period so that there's no, if you like, late flood of uh, members that then need to be managed. I think so it's it was a mistake last time, part. wasn't it? It was a mistake from your perspective last time the, to have £3 membership. The issue last time was the logistics of trying to manage it because we have to ensure that those who sign up share the aims and values of the Labour Party. And trying to do that with such with the numbers that we had and in the time we had proved extraordinarily difficult. And I think the National Executive Committee, I'm not saying it's perfect, but they've done their very best to try and make this a manageable and fair process. Right. I mean, it, it, to, to a normal person, I'm not saying you're not normal, but to a normal person <laughs> watching this <laughs> oh, and trying to navigate their way through the rules, it, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's not grown-up politics, is it, Matt Rack? I mean, it, Jeremy Corbyn refusing to leave the room during the NEC meeting, Labour's National Ruling Executive, when he was asked to do so, attempts to circumvent the rules on registered supporters that could join affiliated unions. I know that loophole's been closed, but none of this is what well, I would call grown-up politics. First of all, let's be clear. Jeremy Corbyn is a member of the National Executive with voting rights. There's no uh, 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 obligation for him to leave any meetings. He's entitled to attend sure, the meeting. but he was can asked I, can I address to. The I'm point saying, is it grown-up? Yeah, it absolutely, it's grown up. I've never been in a. I've been in a labour movement all my life. I've never seen a committee where a, a person who's entitled to a vote at a committee is asked to leave that meeting. That's that's pretty uh, scandalous. But on the question of the member, I think there's a number of things going on here. I was at a meeting of our national executive yesterday, a firefighter, 39 years service, who joined the Labour Party in January of this year, has now been excluded. That's exactly the sort of people Labour should be having in its in its ranks. Uh, and you, you've, you've hit on a contradiction that actually he's ruled out. Yes. Someone who can join in a narrow two-day window can actually vote. And the, the other point on the, on the, the two-day window is actually from moving three pounds. I think uh, there's a valid argument that it wasn't necessarily covering the costs last year, but a, a, a cost of ten pounds or so I think would have been twenty-five pounds will exclude low-paid workers, young people, pensioners, and exactly the sort of people Labour should be appealing to. You're terrified that Jeremy Corbyn would basically win again, so you're pricing out people who vote for him. No, no, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think you have to have a manageable process, Joe. And I go back, I mean, I was a party <laughs> activist, the best part of you know, 20 years before I became a member of Parliament. And you have to be able to manage this process. You have to be able to ensure that those who sign up to vote share the aims and values of the Labour Party. And there was a terrific problem in doing that last summer. We have to respond to that and we have to have a manageable process. These are people who've already joined the Labour Party. About 135,000 people will be excluded who are existing who are Labour Party members. Right, that's pretty that, scandalous. That, but that would have been the same. You know, when I was selected as a member of Parliament in March 2015, there would have been recent joiners of my constituency party who would have been excluded from voting too. Because it gives that management to the process and ensures that those who vote share our aims and values. It's perfectly simple. Are you saying that those people don't, including no, the members of my president of, of my not. union, Matt, doesn't share Matt, Labour you know values? I'm not saying that. It's the process by which you ensure that everyone who joins up does. Right. Let's, have, let's, let's just have a look at what some people have said about Jeremy Corbyn clinging on to power when his parliamentary party has deserted him, has no confidence in him. Mm. Let's say he does get re-elected, Matt Rack. He still won't have the support of Labour MPs. I interviewed one yesterday, Stephen Kinnock. I've spoken to others. They say they still won't uh, serve in a shadow cabinet. He won't be able to get his domestic agenda through. Let's just look at it in practical terms. He will be failing Labour supporters and Labour voters because there will continue to be no functioning opposition in Parliament, which is where his domestic agenda would be set out. Take the example of Trident on Monday. There'll be nothing that's put forward that represents Jeremy Corbyn's view on Monday. Clive Lewis, the Shadow Defence Secretary, has asked for a free vote. Well, I think that we're now entering a process. I hope it will be a democratic debate no. about policies. And I would expect Labour MPs to comply and accept the decision at the, of the Labour Party at the end of that process. Right, now, I would right, urge, I'm just, sure that Nick will. I'm sure that uh, actually... No, they've said they are, won't. What people, that's, that's are what, now, what people are saying now and what they say after a contest, I think, may well be too different things. Right. Answer the question, though, about the fact that at the moment there's no functioning opposition. Those policies of the Labour Party are not being put well, forward. Well, that is very regrettable. And that's right. uh, clearly people have been coordinating this for a very long time, as we discussed the other week. Uh, it, it, so, some okay. uh, Labour MPs, I think... No, not some. 80%. Have, have let, well, I think there are some people who've been involved in planning this for a long time, right. and there are people who've been got caught up in it. I hope that people will listen. There's clearly a mood in the Labour Party that this ends. Constituency 
parties all over the country have been asking their MPs not to support the coup against Jeremy Corbyn. And it, remarkably, now they've been told not to meet. All right, well, further. let's ask, let's ask, ask if, if Jeremy Corbyn is elected again, will you fall in behind Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and others who are still in the shadow cabinet and support their domestic policy agenda? We, we have to respect the outcome of the leadership election, yes. I mean, clearly, I, I've, made, I've resigned. I mean, I was not part of any coup, as I said, when I last debated yeah. this issue with Matt. I resign because there is this catastrophic loss of confidence in Jeremy's leadership, but I can, you know, support the Labour Party and our aims as a member of Parliament in a variety of ways. And I will respect what the result is on the 24th of September. Right. I mean, and Matt, that's right, welcome. And that is, that is welcome. That's where we want to be. All right. We'll have a debate. So who's going to win this contest now? Because clearly this is a sort of battle between two camps here trying to get as many of their supporters out. That's what it's turned into. Um, it, it, it's a leadership contest that is about who can get more of the supporters out and how many you can sign up in this two days in the end. Uh, so who well, do you think will win it? Well, what I can say is I had a meeting of our union's executive yesterday. There is great enthusiasm to support on the executive to support Jeremy Corbyn's campaign because of the policies that he stood for. He stood by working people. He stands for workers' rights. He stands for public services. And those are the things that we want to hear from a Labour Party. And unfortunately, we haven't always heard it. Is support seeping away in the way that some MPs, like Stephen Kinnock, said yesterday? There are certainly people who've spoken to me who supported Jeremy last year who are telling me that they wouldn't do so now. But just to say one thing, Joe, I mean, you made the point about a race to sign people up. But actually, there are hundreds of thousands of long-standing Labour members out there too who will make a decision in this contest. It isn't just about people who join up. It's about a considered decision by our party members. The party and its future in terms of splitting or not. Owen Smith, one of the leadership challengers, being supported by you, claimed yesterday that John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, said he was prepared to split the party if that's what it takes. Denied by John McDonnell, but Owen Smith insists that's what was said. Is it worth splitting the party over? No, I think nobody right. wants to see a split in the no, Labour no, Party. I know it's nobody what, wants what to see want... it, but is it worth it for Jeremy Corbyn to stay? Is it worth the party splitting? No, there's a democratic process. Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn has committed to that, Jeremy, that democratic process and is a long-standing loyal member of the Labour Party and Labour MP. He's not raised remotely the question of a split. The only, que I mean, the only people who are raising the questions mm -hmm. of splits, unfortunately, a Labour MEP wrote an article in the, the New Statesman two weeks ago and, suggesting... And, and John McDonnell so claims Owen well, Smith. So, so claims Owen Smith. But I'm saying people are putting in... Not just Owen right, Smith, but the others people, in the room people well. in, There were five in, right, people in that room. The Labour MP in the New Statesman just three weeks ago, I believe, Nick, uh, said that she supported a split in the Labour Party if Corbyn wins. That's, that's not the way to go into... That's saying we'll, we'll participate so in an election, condemn, but if we lose, we'll... We'll you'd, condemn, you'd condemn John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, no, if he was said John, that. If John says he didn't say that, then John didn't say that. Uh, John, uh, John is very committed to the Labour Party. He's a, a long-standing Labour Party member and Labour MP. Thank you both. Thank you. News still coming in thick and fast. Uh, Theresa Villiers, the Northern Ireland Secretary, has resigned. Uh, she says in her resignation statement that the Prime Minister offered her uh, another role. Doesn't specify what, we don't know yet, but it was not one that she felt she, she could take. So Theresa Villiers now out of the government. It's an interesting thought that it took Margaret Thatcher about four years to get a cabinet that she wanted... Theresa May looks like she's done it in 24 hours to get the kind of cabinet she wants. And she's not just changing the cabinet. There are major changes, we think, underfoot in the structure of mm. government. So the business department is currently constituted, looks like gone. Department of Energy and Climate Change, looks like it's gone entirely. Oh. Transport, looks like it's gone. And we understand now that there will be, or this is what we're being told, sources tell us, uh, to the BBC that the, there will be a new department of business, energy and industry. So energy and climate change will move into a business department, which I would suggest means energy policy will change because it will be driven more by industry rather than by climate change, as it was at, uh, at DEC. We also understand that there could be a new infrastructure uh -huh. department to be set up as well, which is probably... We think where transport could end up. So, interesting. As you can, very interesting. I mean, it's quite. Um, well, that's very. These uh, are quite major dramatic. changes there. In fact, I think more major changes. It was Ted Heath in 1970 that brought in major changes with an environment department and a trade and industry department that he created. And this is one of the biggest shakeups in Whitehall uh, departments 
going way back to then. So how do these white hole departments then get organized now? Let's listen to two of the men heading two of the new departments. So what are your priorities in this role? Oh, we'll decide all those uh, collectively. And what, are you going to be prioritising access to the single market in this position? Uh, wait and see. Is Boris Johnson your boss now? Oh, I think we've got a wonderful uh, future as a country. I think we've got uh, tremendous opportunities to increase our global profile um, and we uh, should be extraordinarily optimistic and confident about and the future. Well, that's the new Minister for, Minister for Trade, if I can call them that. Let's mm. see how significant these white hole changes are. We're joined by Julian McRae from, fittingly, the Institute for Government. And I think we can say this morning there's a lot of change in the structure of government, much more than we thought when we booked you to come on. Mm. It's sounding like that, isn't it? Um, it's always dangerous to comment on the speculation, but it does seem like it's a very large change to the structure of government to the shape of departments. And we haven't seen this for quite a time because mm. David Cameron was very conservative about this, mm. probably because he didn't believe that changing things round actually makes people concentrate on the day job. It tends to distract them into, well, what's happening, who's sitting where, how's this operating? It sort of may reflect Mrs May's priorities, though, Francis. I mean, you've have been at the heart of government for many uh, years. Uh, there's been lots of talk of giving infrastructure a new yep. role, and that includes transport, so roll them together. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, as you will know, that energy policy was a bit of a mess, mm. uh, almost as big a mess as it is in Germany at the moment. Mm. So align that more with the business department. It, it, I think these, these are not changes just for the sake of changes, are they? They reflect, I would suggest, the direction the May government wants to go. Yes, I mean, it sounds like that. Um, I mean, I'm always rather sceptical about Whitehall changes because they just cost a load of money and you move a lot of deck chairs around and... New titles. End up, uh, new, new titles. New plaques. The same people sitting at slightly different desks. And, and, you know, it's always... The theory is always to kind of create joined-up government, but all you do is you move the boundaries to different places and, and, you, and you disrupt all the ways for people to work together across those boundaries. So it is very disruptive... Um, and there can be benefits from it. I mean, the biz department, which I was partly in over the last year, I think is a poorly led, not um, officially led department, um, and needs shaking up. It's led, a, poorly led but, but by the permanent bureaucracy. Yes, think? absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and I've, I found it not a uh, high functioning. And, and universities have now gone back to education, which is where they were many yes. years ago which when we of, all started out talking about this. Which kind of makes sense. <laughs> it kind of makes sense because I, I, I understand that universities are connected to education. Uh, we've got two new departments, in a sense, with specific roles, one for trade deals, Liam Fox, yeah. one with the specific task of negotiating our withdrawal from the European Union. Where do they get the people for that? <laughs> well, at the moment, I mean, you're right at the heart of this. It's very easy to talk about new organisations in abstract and just set them up by, you know, Francis is exactly right. You know, actually, it's the same people that you're trying to organise into these spaces. At the moment, they're pulling in a lot of people from around Whitehall mm -hmm. into particularly the Brexit department. Um, that um, will go on for the next few weeks. I mean, this, this is literally finding desks and making sure people have the, you know, the internet connection or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, as they get down to work, they may well base that around some of the infrastructure at the Cabinet Office, which can do a bit of that. Yeah. It's better than just setting up a whole new organisation. Trade is interesting. I mean, you know, it, there was a thought that maybe the Brexit minister would get trade as well and create a proper permanent department mm. that could go on, uh, whereas instead we've got this department that's short-term, just doing the negotiation, and a but, trade department separate you, from but, it. But the trade minister could be, the, is under instructions how to go and do as many uh, trade mm. deals as they can. Yeah. No one person could do that, travelling around the world to do that and do the negotiations at yeah. the same time. No, I think that's right. I, yeah. I, mean, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's going to be fascinating but, but to see how many, how many negotiations we can really get underway Let as me well ask you this, this because, I mean, after all, Mrs May, a month ago, two weeks ago maybe, didn't know she was going to be Prime Minister. Now, when Ted Heath came in in 1970, he had given massive thought to how to reorganise Whitehall and the departments, and it was big, first ever Department of the Environment in the Western world. Uh, even Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, they made sure they had yeah. thought about them, debated yeah. them privately, and yet here we have this 
major change. We have no evidence that Mrs May was ever thinking of any of this. Yeah, well, I mean, and also around elections, the opposition tends to talk to the civil service mm -hmm. very privately and give them warning of this. We put that in deliberately because actually this is hugely disruptive. This is mm -hmm. people who will be sitting at their desks thinking, where am I working? How do I, um, where am I going to be based next? There'll be loads of things like the wage levels between these well, departments yeah. are different. People will spend ages talking about that. And it's just un well, a little dangerous to stick this distraction on top of the huge challenges for government. Mm -hmm. But also remember, we'll probably have to reorganise UK government again as it becomes clear what exactly our new relationship with Europe is, mm. how much we have to do that we haven't done previously. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a little surprising that she's chosen to do this big change this quickly, with presumably this little planning. Right, well, thank you for that. It'll keep the Institute of Government in a job, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to I'm get not to, sure to, that is necessarily well, what the I nation was hoping the primary for. Purpose. <laughs> uh, we are, can now confirm, because it's on a 10 Downing Street press release, that Jeremy Hunt will continue as Secretary of State for Health. Well, we've uh, managed to get that wrong about six different ways so far, so it's finally good <laughs> to get the record straight. The new and Baroness leader... Evans is the new leader of the House of Lords. There we Interest go. Interest for you? Yep. A yep. good thing? She's very good, yeah. yeah. I've known her a long time. She's uh, very young, but um, oh, very extremely capable, bright. Yep. Henrietta Barnett School and the University of Cambridge. Yep. Uh, there, and of course, Justice Greening, uh, state school educated, head now of the education department. Mm, indeed. Again, playing to Mrs May's, at least her rhetoric anyway, yep. if not her agenda. All right, well, you might remember, we've just had a referendum in Britain's membership of the EU. It was only three weeks ago, although it might seem a lot longer. It does. But there have been calls from some quarters for a second referendum, including one this morning from Labour leadership challenger Owen Smith. Later in the year, MPs will debate a petition on Parliament's website calling for a second referendum after it was signed by more than four million people. The idea has already been debated in the House of Lords. Let's have a listen to Labour's Una King talking about what she thinks should happen. In the interests of democracy, the British people must be given the chance to vote on the deal to leave the EU once we finally know what that deal is and what that deal costs in terms of our economy, our jobs, our pensions, our future, our global influence, our geographical borders, and last but certainly not least, our precious identity as a tolerant, open-facing nation. I say, let the people decide. Well, that was Una King in the House of Lords. And to discuss the possibility of a second referendum or vote, I'm joined by the Labour MPs, David Lammy and Frank Field. David voted to remain in the EU and Frank voted to leave, just to make that clear. Now, the online petition, David Lammy, that calls for a second EU referendum will de be debated, as we said, in Parliament after it was signed by 4.1 million people. But why? What's the point? There's not going to be a second referendum. Well, we have a petition process and actually that's a record number of people for any petition I think that we've had right. in the House of Commons. So that's the first thing, the people want it. Fine. The second thing is to say, Joe, there is no plan. When we say Brexit means Brexit, it's absolutely not clear what the plan is. There are a number of very remorseful leavers who say we're not going to get 250 million a week. How can you get free trade without free movement? all of these issues. So on that basis, those that have signed the petition say, actually, can we have a second referendum on the plan if one emerges? Uh, now, there's another view, and the other view is it should come back to Parliament. All of that is out there, and ultimately, we should actually be having debates and votes in the House of Commons. Right, let's just be clear, though. This, the Petitions Committee has said the debate did not mean it was supporting the call for a second referendum, i.e. rerunning the referendum that we have just had. It was too late to change the referendum rules. That's one thing. Having the debate is fine. What you're suggesting is having a referendum on the deal or the plan that is then actually put together by the Theresa May government. You support that, do you? No, my primary view is actually it should come back to Parliament. My primary view is there should be no Article 50 without Parliament acting, but ultimately the plan has to either come back to Parliament or back to the people. What Very do you say, clear Frank Field? There's an awful lot of people, 4.1 million people. Then you add people who have got buyer's remorse and the plan that no-one knows what it looks like. Why shouldn't Parliament be the, the body that decides whether we actually trigger Brexit? Well, there were 17 million voting to actually come out. Uh, it's not surprising uh, that people may be wanting a second view on this. I'm not against Parliament having a debate on that.
But they, I think people have noticed today the government's moved on. The government has actually shaped itself about implementing the pledge that people actually wanted in that referendum. And we've got the key ministries announce first about how we disengage from our current relationship with Europe uh, to forge a, a new one. Right. So the idea that the government's going to go back on that is just living in cuckoo land. But it's true That's to say it was advisory, happen. though, isn't it? I mean, the, the referendum result was advisory. That's true. Well, you can say that, but I mean... But, but it is the well, fact, isn't well, it? Well, let's look what Miss, Mrs May doesn't think it's advisory. Mrs May is actually acting on it. Her key first appointments were about implementing the referendum pledge. The idea that it was merely advisory, given the state that politics is in and the distrust of politicians, I think is an absurd idea. You need to catch up, David Lammy. I mean, everybody does. It was a decisive vote. You may not like it, and those 4.1 million people may not like it, but it has happened, and the government is moving ahead with trying to turn it, as they would argue, into something positive. There's no going back. You cannot describe a vote in which 67% of those eligible to take part did not vote for it as decisive. 16 million people in Britain did not vote to leave the EU and 13 million people stayed at home, so I imagine they like the status quo. If we want to remain a united country, then actually, let's listen to the advice, but let's recognise that a larger chunk of the country did not go for this. The economy is going south. We have no trade deals with any other country in the world. It will take quite a long time to negotiate them. Let us pause. Let us reflect. Let us think very carefully about the future of this country. Yes, accept the advice, but accept that many millions of people did not vote for Brexit. The many more than did, in fact. The last thing we want to do is <laughs> pause. Um, a decision has been made, the government is actually carrying it out, and it's crucial we now get on implementing that agenda. The agenda, I think, is something different, where the tension is going to be, and it's going to be particularly acute for the Labour Party. The country has voted to leave. Overwhelmingly, Labour members of Parliament in favour of staying. So that's why David quite rightly says, let's bring it back to Parliament. And Owen Parl Smith, one of the leadership challengers, has said he wants a second vote once a Brexit well, deal is I mean, agreed. That, that, that's the same as David's, and I think there's no right, there's no, no, I mean, it's just, well, I'm speechless, the idea of people <laughs> thinking that's relevant to our, what's actually happening at the present time. The key thing will be that the people have actually voted to come out. And there is a majority in Parliament that actually wants to remain. The tension right. will be, how does the government manage the exit strategy... We've run out, we've when, run out when of time, we need, afraid, I'm but sorry, thank we you. We need to go straight back over to Norman Smith to get an update on the Cabinet reshuffle. Uh, Norman, uh, Jeremy Hunt to stay after all. Do we know what's been happening this morning? Did we just get it wrong, or has it been in and out? Uh, <laughs> we don't, is the short answer. We got signs saying he was being sacked, then we got signs saying he was moving on of, of his own volition, then he turned up here, so you think he's been moving anyway, and then he comes out and he says he's staying where he is, so goodness knows what's going on. But one thing we do know is Teresa Villas, she was offered another job and said, actually, no thanks, I'm leaving. I'm trying to work out what that might be. I wonder whether it is Justine Greening's old birth at International Development and she just thought after Northern Ireland she did not want to be traipsing around the world. She wanted time back at base camp. Perhaps that might have been it. The other thing which I think interesting about uh, Theresa Villas is from where I'm sitting, the male pale and stale guys are doing quite well because I'm not seeing a whole load of women coming in here uh, as we had been promised because by my counting, um, She's lost Nicky Morgan, the Education Secretary, mm. and she's now lost Theresa Villas. And I'm not seeing any new faces because Amber Rudd obviously was in Cabinet, Justine Greening, uh, she was also in the Cabinet, Liz Truss was also in the Cabinet. So I can only presume that we are going to see a lot of women this afternoon if, if Mrs May is going to meet her pledge to have a record number of women in this Cabinet. Norman, we're going to leave it there and we're going to leave you looking for the women. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of job that somebody has to do, and I think it's, it's a safe job in your hands. And we look forward to updates throughout the afternoon. Thank you. That's it for today. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have time to bring you our cartoonist. Uh, we simply ran out of time there. Cartoons are always fun, and we wanted to talk about how the cartoonists were going to depict Mrs May, but we'll have 
plenty of time to do that in the weeks and months ahead. The one o'clock news is starting over on BBC One. Now, there's no question time tonight, but there is a this week. I'll be back here at 11.45 on BBC Two with Alan Johnson, Michael Portillo, Alan Rosen, Miranda Green and Keris Matthews. And I'll be back again here tomorrow because we never stop working. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.